welcome uh, to this evening's uh, visiting artist program with um, filmmakers John Acompra and Lena Gopal. We're especially grateful to you all being here. I'm sure some of you don't have power, and we appreciate your forbearance as we had to rearrange all this because of the hurricane. My name is Leela Kinney. I'm the executive director of arts initiatives here at MIT and also of the new Center for Art, Science, and Technology, which has recently been funded by the Mellon Foundation. This um, evening's screenings and discussion are part of a, a whole series, Cinematic, uh, cinematic uh, Migrations, which is a two-year collaborative project co-presented by the Visiting Artists Program and the Program in Art, uh, Culture, and Technology, ACT, here at MIT, along with Comparative Media Studies and one of its newest research groups, the Open Documentary Lab. lab. It was initiated by Renee Green, the head of ACT, uh, also a free agent media. You'll hear from her shortly. She'll introduce the artists and the program that we have uh, this evening. Let me just say a brief word about upcoming events. We have had this uh, slideshow on here, so I hope you've seen uh, the Visiting Artists website. You can sign up there to get um, email announcements about the series and any um, uh, details about all the programs. Our next artist is Tomas Saraceno, who will be here on November 15th, giving a public lecture that will take place in 10 to 50, along with Nada Tarani, the head of the uh, architecture program, and a professor in architecture, Anton Garcia Abril. I hope you'll join us all for that. There's another program in January and yet another in March uh, featuring uh, Don Byron. I don't know if any of you were able to hear this really marvelous concert um, with Don Byron and his new gospel quintet in Kresge uh, last Saturday night in the spring. He'll be performing with the MIT Wind Ensemble and also writing a new piece, premiering a new piece that will feature uh, uh, Evan Zaporin on our faculty, who is also a member of the Visiting Artist Committee and the faculty director of CAST, a superb clarinetist, composer, new music, um, uh, all-round all maestro. So I hope you'll be joining us for that. I'm really pleased to recognize the collaboration that this um, residency represents. Uh, ACT plus the Open Doc Lab, which is this new platform of comparative media studies, which was created in part to revive the great legacy of documentary filmmaking here at MIT that goes back to Ricky Leacock and Ed Pincus. I think we're going to see really wonderful things develop from this um, collaborations. And one of the reasons, by the way, that the Visiting Artists Committee solicits nominations for pro programs and artists from any lab department center unit um, at MIT is because we know there is really great ongoing research and we in these programs. We sort of believe in the collective wisdom and we believe in nurturing that research. So we're really happy when new kinds of experiments and formats um, emerge or bubble up from this process. And that is certainly the case with this uh, residency, which will take place over two years and culminate in a symposium in the spring of 2014 that I know you'll hear more about from uh, Renee Green uh, in the coming months. I want to offer just a few words of special thanks. You saw the names of the Visiting Artist Committee that helps us select the artist and design this program. We're grateful to all of them. The ACT staff, especially Marion Cunningham, but all of the staff has been in, in, in essential to this project. William Uricchio and Sarah Wallison of Comparative Media Studies and the Open Doc Lab. And last but certainly not least, thank you to the List Visual Arts Center for finding us a 16 millimeter projector this evening. Thank you all for coming and may I introduce Renee Green, artist and head of the MIT program in art, culture and technology. Thank you, Leela. Um, I'm going to keep my comments relatively brief because um, this is going to be a double feature this evening, um, unexpectedly. Um, I'm very happy to welcome both John Acumfra and Lena Gopal. Uh, and as you saw, probably from the slides, um, they are uh, the co-founders uh, of the seminal 
film and video group, Black Audio Film Collective, uh, and they are now um, uh, uh, the, the directors um, and producers of the production <laughs> company, Smoking Dog Films. Uh, and um, we will talk more about these different endeavors later. Um, but the collaborative way that they've worked is something that's significant and that we were discussing in the seminar. This project, Cinematic Migrations, is something that um, is, uh, sort of instigated from realizing um, the many kinds of changes that have occurred in terms of cinema uh, in the present and even the definition of cinema. Uh, it's not even clear what that might be in the description uh, that I have written describing what this project could be about. Um, uh, I mentioned that the desire for cinema is something that uh, perhaps existed before there was in any kind of tangible thing uh, known as cinema. And uh, as John described it, the porousness of what it is, uh, what this designation, cinematic migration, suggests is precisely what it is that's kind of appealing uh, to all of us who are engaging in, in this process of probing. Um, in terms of migrations, um, some of what we were discussing today, because there's a seminar that's linked to this project, uh, it was mentioned that uh, there had been an entrenchment of what it was believed that cinema was. Uh, this is what John and Lena were discussing. Uh, and there was a knowledge of some kind of distant relations uh, to what would have been imagined to be the dominant cin cinema. Uh, but for various reasons, uh, which have taken place over the past uh, decades, um, these definitions are in turmoil. Uh, and so uh, without saying too much more, I'd like to introduce uh, these films that we're going to be seeing this evening. Um, the, f the way that the evening is going to go is like this. Um, we're going to first watch uh, Handsworth songs. Uh, and um, I won't say too much about it because we're going to be talking about it after the film. Uh, and uh, we will, it, it's shown in two reels, 16 millimeter uh, projection. So there'll be a 30 minute, pa 30 second pause in between reels and then uh, we'll continue, just hang on. And then um, we will have, have a discussion, uh, uh, John, Lena, and I, uh, take a brief break, and then uh, go into watching The Nine Muses, uh, which is a more recent film. And as the title of this e event describes, this is um, about reconsidering uh, Handsworth songs. And so uh, some of you might be familiar with this film uh, and know that it was produced uh, in the 80s uh, at the time of the, shortly after the Handsworth riots that took place in Birmingham. Uh, and then in the last year, last year in, in London and around uh, the UK, there were other riots uh, that took place and this film uh, was shown at that time uh, to um, a large reception. Uh, so um, this is the first. And then the Nine Muses, um, I will introduce it further uh, after we take a brief break. So um, I think we should start. Thank you all for being here. So um, just uh, like to say that um, I'm very glad that you can both be here and, um, and participate in, uh, and actually be an inspiration uh, for cinematic migrations, this two-year project. And um, seeing the film uh, again uh, now uh, kind of sparked a lot of different um, recollections uh, as well as, uh, well, I mean, we've discussed quite a bit today as well in our seminar, but um, I just wanted to mention more about the reason why I uh, wanted to invite you in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, it, well, I, I didn't see this film uh, projected uh, mm -hmm. until uh, the Documenta 2010, mm -hmm. uh, when it was in that 
railway, railway station yes. location. <laughs> and um, yeah, this was uh, 2002. Uh, 2002 in yes. Kassel. And um, yeah, Documenta 11 uh, is when it was presented. Yes. Uh, and it was also presented, I believe uh, there were other works. Was, was, is that correct? Yes. Or was it just on its own? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it was the only black audio piece okay. uh, then. Weirdly, we'd been in Documenta 10 as well. Catherine David mm -hmm. had programmed uh, a film that we made called The Last Angel of History. Mm -hmm. So that was in the cinema, quote unquote, section with Dal history and a whole bunch of, of others. No, so uh, Documenta 11, there was us and, and Minha, Trinity Minha, in that corridor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we fought mm -hmm. over sound like cats and birds. <laughs> <laughs> Minha likes her films to be very quiet and gentle, and mm -hmm. as you can tell from us, we like ours to be very noisy, and yeah. you know, so we, we fought over sound bleed, like for weeks and weeks. Yeah, and I mean, it's just interesting to see it again now, because I actually have, I have not mm -hmm. seen it since then, and um, to, to experience it in this other kind of setting, in this theatrical setting, and uh, to just kind of look at it uh, was part of what I was hoping uh, that we could do and to think about it uh, in terms of the, the reconsideration. Uh, and one of the reasons that I wanted to reconsider it uh, is also, I wanted also it to be introduced. Yes. Uh, because that's something that became, uh, in, in this particular uh, context and also at this time, that's mm. one of the things that uh, struck me uh, when, I, when I got the book Mm. Ghost of Songs, mm. uh, which is, uh, I got it in this, the next documenta mm. <laughs> in 2007, uh, mm. I found um, the Ghost of Songs, mm. uh, which was edited by Kojo Eshun and Anjali Sagar. Mm. Uh, and um, your influence uh, was just seen, was so striking uh, in terms of uh, encountering the book and also actually having a chance to read uh, some of um, the contents and the interviews mm -hmm. uh, and looking back at, looking at details of images and things like that made me want to actually watch the films again mm -hmm. uh, and to think further about them. Uh, but part of what I was, what I learned yes. is that um, there, there somehow needed to be a kind of reintroduction uh, mm. to, to seeing the films. Uh, and, and that's part of what uh, Kojo and you discuss mm. in, that, in that interview mm. that takes place. Mm. Um, and I was, mm. I'm curious about your own thoughts about it um, now. The monograph or? Well, the mon you. well we could the start film. with the, the film. <laughs> <laughs> because now, I mean, for ha particularly okay. in, in, in respect to the fact that Last year, it was just last year mm -hmm. that uh, there were uh, what were described as riots mm -hmm. uh, in London and in different parts around mm -hmm. metropolitan areas, uh, and um, the there was a, a reviewing of the film, uh, and I was wondering from a distance what kinds of ways people were reading it, how mm -hmm. this film was mm -hmm. invoked. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and what kinds of things it's possible to actually grasp. Because that's part of what, what's really interesting yes. to me about yes. the film and well, seeing it know, again I mean, also. What's difficult to grasp? There was, uh, at the beginning of the disturbances last year, sorry, Lina, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll yeah, go no, and can, <laughs> I can see you as well. Um, um, we were approached by a whole number of organizations and institutions in a way strikingly similar to what happened with Handsworth, actually. People saying, you know, you know we, we think you should make a film about the riots now. And, and uh, our position uh, then, and mine in particular, because people kept asking me, you, know, you are the director of Handsworth songs and you <laughs> must make another film. I'm like, no, no, no. We, we will not make a film about another social unrest, again, unless involves 
our generation and uh, the likelihood of a bunch of 50 somethings taken to the street <laughs> to riot is extremely remote so I think you can assume <laughs> safely that, that I will be making another riot <laughs> film again <laughs> you know. and uh, that was it was kind of important because you know when the events started in Birmingham you know we got called by all these organizations that we were connected with. There were three workshops slash collectives in Birmingham. Uh, one, a multicultural one called Wide Angle, a black one called... Uh, oh God, I can't Macro remember. Films. Macro <laughs> Films. Um, there was a Birmingham film mm -hmm. and video workshop mm -hmm. run by one of the mentors, one of the sort of founding figures of cinema studies, a guy called Alan Lovell. And they all called us to say, look, this thing's happened, you better come and do something. Um, and thinking back, I think the reason for that was fairly apparent. You know, everybody knew that there was this bunch of 20-somethings in London who, who just read too many books, seen too many films, had been talking for too long about alternative, you know, film practices and so on. And, and so the sense was, okay, well, you know, <laughs> show us what you got, <laughs> you know. And I remember driving down uh, in this coach with a hastily arranged set of cameras. We got an Eclair from one company and an Arton from another. Mm. We took a Bolex electric, you know, camera that we had, which is the most unwieldy bloody thing imaginable. But we had all these cameras. And I remember th on the way thinking, this is going to be good. I, I just knew. I knew, I knew it was going to be interesting. You know, I knew that that everything we talked about from the Black Heart Convention in 82, which was a year after the riots, when 80 of us, that's all there was. There was 80 students, black students, across Britain <coughs> who were doing <laughs> fine art, who wanted to meet to discuss the way forward. So from 82, when we started these conversations, the 84 discussions between us, Isaac Julian, and a whole bunch of other people about collective practice, the debates at the London Filmmakers Co-op with the experimental, the, you know, the debates around the political and aesthetic, you know, all kinds of stuff had taken place between when I left with Trevor and when Lena and the others left, you know, 82 and then 83, to that summer, when it felt like almost everything we'd done was in preparation for that moment, <laughs> you know. Um, so we went, and then once we shot the stuff and started to gather stuff, people kept saying, well, when is it gonna be ready? It's like, you know, you've had three weeks, like, where's this film? <laughs> and we're like, no, 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 wait, 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 this is not a film. <laughs> this is our investigation um, into what else can be said about this event, other than the fact that they were uh, a, a case of lawlessness, which of course it is. I mean, no, no. But we also felt that it was our, our opportunity, in a sense, to begin to speak about the 1981 riots, where we didn't have any, which which had happened in 81, almost all over um, England, except interestingly enough, Birmingham. Birmingham did not riot in 81. And at that point, we felt really quite silenced. We didn't have the equipment. We didn't have anything. We had all our ideas, and we had a lot to say around the disturbances. So in 85, it was a great opportunity for us to, to say something. It was also happening in London, too. I mean, it, it spontaneously started happening in London. And you saw there um, uh, in, in Tottenham and in Brixton it also happened. And that was pretty much what happened. Birmingham, Tottenham, Brixton. And it gave us the opportunity to say all the things we'd been we'd been storing up since eighty one, you know, especially the criminalisation of particular sort of black areas, you know, and especially young black men. And that was one of just one of the themes we wanted to look at. So by eighty five, we were really quite prepared. Hence, we had all the cameras, mm. you know, and we were, you know, we decided this was this was our opportunity to now say something that we wanted to say. Not anyone else wanted to say, but what we felt about from 81 to 85, what happened to our generation, in a sense. Mm. I mean, this, 
uh, it's interesting to hear uh, that particular aspect of what you described in terms of trying to figure out a way mm -hmm. you could say what it is that you <coughs> want to say exactly. that was different uh, from other ways of, of saying these things. Uh, recently, I've been rereading Imaginary Homelands mm -hmm. uh, by Salman Rushdie. And that kind of, uh, I, I did mention that in the text uh, describing this event uh, in terms of reconsidering, uh, because I've been in the process of reconsidering um, a number of different um, discourses from the 1980s mm. and trying to think about them now. Uh, and when I picked up the book, I had seen that um, Hansworth Songs is in the table of contents, and I was really excited. <laughs> like, oh, that's, oh, great, you know, I'm going to. Uh, read this immediately. So I read it, read the review, mm -hmm. and uh, I was very surprised uh, mm -hmm. at the kind of um, reaction uh, mm -hmm. that he he had mm -hmm. uh, to the film, mm -hmm. and particularly um, about uh, the, the sort of lack of stories. Or this yes. is the thing mm -hmm. that struck yes. me because yes. I thought, oh, that's really mm -hmm. interesting. I hadn't. I never, I didn't think of it in that way. I thought mm. of it as something very different. Mm. Uh, and also that it's something, it's very, very layered. Uh, and <coughs> you used the word textures mm. earlier yeah. today mm. Uh, mm. to talk about mm. your ways of working. And I think it's very, very textured in a number of ways and that the material itself is also uh, conveying something. Um, there, there are there are stories mm. in the material mm. itself, mm. from the sound of voices to the uh, the, the footage that's used, the, the archival mm. footage, mm. Um, the whole overlay of, of different kinds of things taking place. And so I was I was thinking, oh, how it's could he miss the point? <laughs> yeah, it's about is, is it about mm. reading or mm. not being able mm. to uh, uh, recognize? Mm. Mm. Um, mm. what's being said mm. uh, in a different way. And then seeing the film tonight, I, I, it was also very, really interesting to see, to note how many specific stories there, there are. are there mm. and, and that mm. these are not, you know, the, the subjective, uh, subjective aspects of what's in, mm. in the film and, and gathered all together from like, a lot of details of all kinds of things that mm. it's not, um, not they aren't presented in any kind of linear, uh, easily comprehensible way. They have to do. They seem to be much more related to um, uh, different kinds of sensations and feelings, in addition to um, footage that might be something that was recognizable. And well, so this is very different than what it was <coughs> that he that I felt he was was describing. I was wondering what your thoughts were. Ten years, yeah. ten years, flash forward ten years yeah. after that debate, mm. um, because it was a debate. Mm -hmm. That article appeared in The Guardian. It was read by many, and it generated a huge um, discussion, as I knew it would. And, uh, and he mentions it in the introduction of the book, 91. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so, 95, the fatwa had been passed, mm. someone's in hiding. And I go to Colin McCabe's house with Lena because we wanted to make a film about the affair. <laughs> and the security services turn up and there's someone you know, gathered around him, uh, all these guys with big guns, and we sit down. It's the first time we've spoken uh, since the, the, the thing. We used to speak before. And he says, look, I got it wrong, OK? And, uh, and I said, well, listen, that was the best thing that you could have done. <laughs> because actually, uh, we were grappling with something. We thought we'd nailed it. But in the process of debating it in the newspapers, we realized what it was you know, that had to be broken. And what, for me, had to be destroyed was a certain kind of ethnographic veracity, right, which had characterized black and third mm. cinema films up to that point, which was the people told it as it was. They told it straight, you know, and you were supposed to feel the injustice from the celluloid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, 
we're poor and we suffer and this is it. You know, look at our kitchens. We've got no food in it. Look at, you know, all of that. That whole kind of radical documentary tradition, which when it came to black subjects, had a certain way of dealing with that from Lars Graver Dimbaza onwards. Mm. We, we absolutely wanted to destroy that. I mean, well, not destroy it, but to, to, to draw a line which said from this moment on, there had to be some reflection about the nature of these images. There had to be some reflection about the nature of the histories that those images were supposed to speak for. Um, so I knew what he meant. I knew, you know, we shot 70 hours. And in the course of editing, it took more and more and more of the material out. We just kept taking it out because it didn't feel right. Yeah. Didn't, you know, uh, it, didn't, it didn't seem to be getting us anywhere because the critical problem was that a week after the riots, Thatcher and her cronies, <laughs> neoliberal cronies, were on television and they said, these are criminal acts. That's it. So that was the consensus. Now, no amount of us showing, you know, police brutality was going to destroy that regime mm -hmm. of truth. You had to find another way of saying, okay, it may well be criminal, but it's something else as well. You know, and it's a something else as well, which was always missing from, from, from the debate. There were other films, TV documentaries made about the riot, and they, they trotted the litany of complaints that we would normally do. You know, these are people of color, they face oppression, they don't have jobs, they don't, you know, but, but none of it seemed to persuade anybody else, you know, because the, the new right response was, okay, well, but yeah, we know they're poor, but there are also other poor people, you know, so how come they're not right? <laughs> Why is it that these people are right? Now, ah, we know it's because they're black. <laughs> so you had to confront this question of race. There was no way around it. Salman's idea was that if we showed their stories, their real stories, somehow you could usher the, <laughs> the inconvenient truth of the riot out of the, you know what I mean? Like, and it wasn't going to work, no? Mm. Well, and also, yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, we, we, when we first made Handsworth Songs, we took it straight up to Birmingham and we showed it there um, in front of a huge audience. Do you remember, John? Um, and it was so well received. I mean, there was, especially by, um, I think, the first generation, the first generation of my, of, you know, the, the older generation, our parents' generation, who actually began to see that they were reflected their hopes and aspirations were finally shown in some way or another because, you know, none of them, as we've always discussed, came to the UK to, to work hard for years and years, save up, get to, to the UK, and then raise children that were going to take to the streets and riot. You know, that wasn't their hopes and aspirations. No one does that. Um, and I think for a first time, a film actually sort of stepped back and reflected on how did we arrive at this point? You know, what are, what, what happened to get us there? How did, you know, that first generation come over, raise a second generation, and, you know, wherever that second generation uh, was, especially in 81, there was trouble. What, what happened? How did we get there? You know, what, what are the perceptions that people had already about us, about our communities, about, about where we'd come from and what we brought with us, pretty much, you know, to suggest that, all, that, that this was quite normal behavior. And that's really what we were also trying to do. We were trying to say, how did we arrive at this point? You know, and, and I think in Birmingham, that film was so well received. We actually showed it in Hackney, in, you know, very close to where, where we actually um, had our, our studios. And we showed it in Brixton and we showed it in, in Tottenham. And we didn't get any of those sorts of responses at all. The, the Salman Rushdie kind of response. We got, you know, people were really, really, really grateful that we'd made a film that actually took a moment to talk about all these different issues, whether it was the media and the way the media treated um, people, treated black people uh, in, in various areas. I mean, so we just broke it down and we tried to reflect all the particular concerns that that we had ourselves, that that generation also felt that they had. Yeah. 
now. Um, and we got, got great, great turnout. It was enormous turnout mm. that we had. Yeah. So, and then that's a side that's never reflected or, or written about. I mean, mm -hmm. Salman Rushdie's response was in the national newspaper, and a huge debate happened, but no one ever, ever talked about the huge audiences that Handsworth Songs actually had. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think it's a, it might be a good segue mm. uh, to, the, to the next film, uh, yeah. because uh, what I uh, remember from the screening that I went to when I first saw that one, is what John mentioned about epitaph, mm. um, an epitaph for those who, who didn't have one. Yeah. Uh, and this whole discussion that we've been having uh, today also about uh, how, how does one arrive, um, or, and also how we talked a bit about um, ontology mm. and being mm. and the way that uh, there are formations uh, that are created in, in transit and yes. in migration mm. uh, and in longing. Uh, and some of those things come through in, in the in Hansworth songs. It was interesting to see it now after having seen the Nine Muses. Yes. And so maybe uh, we can make a shift uh, yeah, to no, that. Is, it, is, is there absolutely. anything else you'd like to say before we, we do that? No, I mean, I think, I think the, <laughs> the, the question of the epitaph that mm. you quite rightly mm. remembered from that thing is, is critical because the so-called Windrush generation, that's basically the, the generation that started to, to make that shift to, to Britain from 49, is now almost gone. They've almost, I think they're, they're now in their hundreds. Um, and it just struck us that, that in a way something Something needs to be said. There are no, there are no epitaphs. There's no, there's nothing anywhere in England which says, you know, here lies three million men and women of colour who came from across the Commonwealth, from India, Pakistan, Jamaica, Ghana, Nigeria, when these countries were colonial entities, who literally gave their lives to this place to to ensure that it came out of the the ashes and embers of 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 the Second World War. Um, and it just felt right. I'd lost my mother, Lena had lost her father. You know, people were dying, they were just going. And we thought, okay, this, this might be the time you know, to say something about them before they all go. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And none of them got a chance to see it. You know? mm -hmm. So that's really what spurred the, the Nine Muses and the gallery piece never seen that preceded it. Mm -hmm. you know? Just to try and um, bear witness to those lives, you know, to, to, to say something about them, because we hadn't really seen Handsworth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After Handsworth, we became obsessed with our generation and its its issues and its problems. Everywhere we went was really with that, whether it's Malcolm X or Louis Armstrong or Martin Luther King. We were really following our generation's passions mm -hmm. and obsessions and and our own, to be honest, you know. Um, <coughs> The Nine Muses was the really third time after Testament, you know, Handsworth, Testament, and this one. These are the only three films we've made about that generation, and um, it felt right. I mean, I'm, I can't see us ever going back to this <laughs> <laughs> again. But and so it felt right to just mm -hmm. say something before we moved on. There were all kinds of other interests. Now we knew that for us, the question of race had uh, run its narrative course in this way of talking. About so we wanted to, to do it and then just move on. Um, hence the nine musings. <laughs> okay. So um, as we're going to be watching that next, yes. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to suggest just taking a, a very short pause um, while we uh, set up again. Uh, and then we're going to resume um, right away uh, to watch the film say about five minutes break. So, um, and then the, the idea is we'll uh, to have a Q&A afterwards sure. and open this up uh, to anyone who wants to ask any questions. So, um, uh, thank you. Thank you now. <laughs> the second time that I've seen it, seen it now and um, now it's just interesting. I have a different view on it this time. Hmm. 
uh, than, than before, and also the whole made in England aspect of it, and uh, along with the Naxos audio uh, <laughs> and all those different um, voices, recognizable voices, uh, and all of those canonical texts um, intermeshing uh, is, it, it, I mean, I, I think it's very striking. Uh, and I, I thought it was also kind of funny uh, how there had been some kind of publicity about this event uh, at one point about kind of finding a voice. I was thinking, okay, actually, uh, that the voices are the voices are already there. There have been <laughs> loads of voices, <laughs> many, many, many voices, uh, in addition to uh, so much material. Uh, I found it incredible to see it again, uh, and in particular in the combination with having seen the Hansworth songs and then to go into this. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious, I don't, I, if you want to say anything or if anyone has any questions or oh, comments, <laughs> open it up uh, <laughs> to, to you guys who are Stalwarts. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, that I've seen it a little bit, and that was really spectacular. And I wanted to ask you guys about, um, I like the images and the voice, but I also think the sound in it is just amazing, and how it moves through the different passages. And can you tell me how that gets made? Alongside of with it with the images and then the passages that you choose, like how do you weave that together? Yeah, no, they can. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, the whole thing is one big process. I mean, uh, everything in it is that's music, quote unquote, has some some importance all the people I've worked with. Um, the uh, Indian piece, the Drupad piece in it, were made by two guys I respect enormously. I met them about 15 years ago and they wanted to find a way of using some of their pieces, <coughs> so that's why it's there. The sound design is with the same guy from the collective who's made all the sound pieces since 82. <laughs> you know, so it's all stuff that um, we know, love, and the question always is, how do you get them to talk to each other? Not in harmony necessarily, but just have a conversation with each other. How do you create something out of a set of noises, really? Not interested in the music. I'm interested in noise. Much, much more interested in noise than I am in music. So everything is there for a certain kind of noise value, a certain pitch value, a certain chromatic atonal quality that it has. And then you just try and fashion something. You know, no plan. Just, just, just go for it. Trial and error. Yeah, but there's there's also a huge big sound designer too that we have that we've worked with for probably about um, 20 years now too there's Trevor <clears throat> then there's um, Robin who also does yeah does a lot of work with us and it takes just on his level about two or three weeks of breaking down things and and reconstructing them um, you know marrying together also the work that we've already done in the edit but you know, he, he brings a freshness to, to some, some of the, uh, the sounds and the mix just takes a long time. Because everything's so mute. There's no, mm. there's no sound to start with. We build from, from scratch, everything. Wind, rain, the whole lot. Mm. <coughs> Can you please explain to me, to us, uh, the presence of late motives. You have them visually and you have them narratively. Uh, the figure, 
in the yellow coat that we see approaching, receding, walking. So this is almost <laughs> nagging at us constantly. <laughs> and the line about the womb goes on and on. And just, I mean, are they obsessive gesture or do they have other meanings that you could share with us? There, there, there are, uh, there I say, certain ethnographic veracities to the piece. I mean, a lot of it is based on. Um, I mean, we've been filming, interviewing, documenting you know, that generation really pretty much from the get-go for different forms of projects. And um, one of the things I've always said about this piece is that it's really based on three fairly uh, consistent motifs that emerge from these. Um, when you speak to uh, people who came over in the 50s and 60s in particular, they would always say three things very clearly. Usually, you know, not necessarily in any order, but one was that when they arrived, uh, they felt they stood out. They felt very colorful. Uh, these are people coming from you know, spaces outside of rationed Europe with this monochrome. You know, everybody wore blue and black. You know, people are coming from countries with saris and <laughs> loud gabardine suits and all the rest of it. So they really did stand out. And the attempt, attempt was to try and find a way of registering that difference. Um, the other thing they always mentioned was that when they arrived, they, were, they always felt alone. And this didn't seem to matter whether they came as a group or, you know. Um, uh, and the final thing was that, that it was cold. And <laughs> <laughs> this didn't seem to matter, as I said many times, whether they came in the summer or winter. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you realize that you were, we were really in, in the field of the psychic. I mean, these are kind of psychic dramas that were played out again and again compulsively in the lives of different people. Um, and so the attempt really was to try and find a way of, of, of rendering that quote unquote visual. Uh, so uh, hence the slightly obsessive compulsive way in which we come at it. So yes, you're right. They're, they are motifs, but those are motifs that we didn't put into the piece. They kind of arrived at our door. I actually was thinking about Last Angel <coughs> history as well when seeing oh. these figures this time. <laughs> thinking, <Yes>. hmm. <laughs> interesting. Well, you know, I mean, uh, we showed it. I showed the grad group this morning where we started, which was really in tape slides, that's what we did for the first few years of our existence as a group. And, and you learn something about the nature of portraiture and, and stillness, and, you know, just trying to fashion narratives, Parajanov-like, out of what are essentially quote-unquote non-cinematic scenarios very attached to that, very attached to, to the idea. And I think most of us were, not just in the black audio fold, but you know, if you look at Looking for Langston or any of the other stuff that emerged from, from the black Brit firmament in the 80s, there was a lot of investment in, in the iconic, you know, in scenarios which are basically um, ones of inactivity. That's so I want to a better word. Um, and so it's one of the continuities from, from that early work. You know. but, but I have to say, it wasn't a conscious thing this time. This time, we were really trying to find a way of doing justice to those testimonies, you know, um, to have them mirror you know, some of these epic texts on becoming. You know, it was really an attempt to find something that might speak to Milton <laughs> and speak to the Odyssey and, 
you know, all these great tales of arrival and becoming, and the journeys which become home and the process which becomes the life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's really trying very hard to um, to fashion a counterpoint to those ideas and voices, and that's that's where that comes from. It's only afterwards I thought, shit, doing the same thing again. <laughs> <laughs> People are standing still <laughs> again. I'm walking. <laughs> The usage of the canonical text seems yes. to be all stemming from the Euro-Christian, if one can say, yes. or Euro-Christian, not even Judaic or uh, tradition. Uh, while all of these people, immigrants, have a literature, have poetry, uh, have a language, mm. why did you choose uh, to go this route? <laughs> Good question. question we've been asked. And it's one that, that comes up quite okay. often. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the, the gesture is certainly not to deny that there had been George Lamin or B.S. Naipaul. That's almost certainly not the gesture. In fact, the attempt was to escape a certain kind of tautology that would involve one of having those voices speak to those images. Um, I don't believe in that symmetry anyway, because I think it's a false one. The idea that somehow these people must have their literature or their voices seem to me to be false. But, but in a much more profound way, everything in that film doesn't belong to them. Nothing in that film is, is theirs. The archive, every frame was shot by, you know, an Englishman or woman, um, and so it seemed much more appropriate, I think, to to literally fashion everything from that canon. You know. And there's a certain kind of provocation involved as well, um, in anticipation of precisely this this question because um, you know what one wants to do is to make a certain claim for for a version of English that you know I you know everything in there we grew I up had with learned yes. <laughs> as a child. <laughs> you know, my mother read us Paradise Lost. It's one of my favorite pieces. I never liked Shakespeare. I loved Milton. Um, and so in a very real sense, it's ours. It is as much ours, if you like, as the images. <laughs> you know? But you get, this, um, you get this interesting discussion where um, people say, but you put their voice to our image. And I, I say, no, 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 <laughs> you got it wrong. None of it's yours. <laughs> if we're going to make arguments of propriety, none of it belongs to us. It's all. It comes from the archive, the British Broadcasting Corporation. <laughs> you know, it's a corporation. It, it's not. Um, it's not white. It's just a corporation. But that corporation was supposed to be for the nation, and we are part of that nation. You know. Um, so I think it is almost letting those images off the hook by marrying them with outside discourses, you know, with... Um, the yeah, but also that. But I mean, you know, the, see, the, 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 the other point is that um, Naipaul and Baldwin and Lamin and all these people became important for my generation, mm -hmm. you know. Um, everybody in that film is British. They, they're not foreigners. They, they went from one part of the empire to the next, with the exception maybe of the Indian subjects. Everybody in it was, was, was British. I mean, they were formally and legally British. And so they would have, had they gone to any of the prestigious public schools in Lahore yeah. to Accra, 
that's what they would have studied. Mm. Mm. Not, not the burgeoning post-colonial yes, literature that came yeah. to define <laughs> my exactly. generation. You know? <laughs> and so it's on, it felt mm. more honest to say, okay, we're you know, if you're going to go mm. into this space and speak from that space, mm. let's do it without um, alibis. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I just, I, I think it's interesting to think about it in terms of the parents um, very much because, I mean, when I was watching it also, in, in, and this is from my perspective of being formed in this country, but in terms of the references, and uh, the, it also relates to particular um, class, I guess, as yes. well as uh, aspirations, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the whole idea of what a kind of culture might mean. Mm. Uh, mm. There were a number of recognizable sounds that I, mm. I noticed uh, also. Uh, say, was it Leontine Price who was singing? Oh, yes. And yes. then um, also a Paul Robeson voice yes. on the record. Yes. And mm. um, just and, and the, under the Milkwood, uh, mm. the <laughs> Dylan Thomas was yeah. very familiar, and so I think that if there's a kind of Anglo, um, you know, aspect of what you grew up with, yes. which is, would also apply in in other locations, I think that this is really, it. I think it does touch on a number of different um, things, and the way that you've combined them is what I, I find it very provocative. Mm. Uh, and 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 touching um, because it's to 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 fashion something from mm. all of these different aspects and then uh, also keep interjecting the figure mm. as well mm. as uh, those images of the, that's Trevor mm. Matheson isn't mm. it in mm. those all that's kinds of different <laughs> situations. <laughs> yes. in, uh, in the in concrete uh, <laughs> I'm in cylinder, <laughs> <laughs> things like that, yeah. <laughs> and um, it had a, a very haunting quality to it with the stillness. I didn't mean that it was the same as, as the other, no, but, but more it was so persistent, <laughs> mm. <laughs> this figure, mm. these figures mm. in this mm. cold, well, the snowy and frozen landscape that it, it was really... I found it haunting um, in this. I mean, I thought it was haunting before, but it was so persistent. <laughs> you just had to evoke, <laughs> evoke that, that, that feeling. It was, it was quite a difficult thing to try and do, mm -hmm. um, to try and evoke that feeling of loneliness, that feeling of arriving somewhere. What, how do you try and visualize arriving somewhere and it's cold and you stand out and you feel that consistently all the way throughout your your time in England. And, and I suppose it, it, it was pretty stark, but it, it, it needed something. But I mean, the combination formally is really interesting that the, it's you know, such high definition of the still imagery in the frozen, cold places with the uh, more granular uh, material that's with uh, m motion uh, and vibrating <laughs> also <Absolutely>. frames. <laughs> well, that's the counterpoint because it's mm -hmm. not, you know, we're not trying to dramatize real scenarios. Mm -hmm. It's not like, mm -hmm. it's not real. Half these people are dead, <laughs> mm -hmm. including our own parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks for a lovely both the films. I just had a uh, looking at both the film and this film. Uh, there is a kind of a double bind in this film which is very intriguing in the sense that you almost feel geologically situated in a sense that the, the, the energetic, the mythical, yes. all is beneath. Uh, just, and in a sense that you see this whole energy being brought into the surface, mm -hmm. but the film has this dominant feel of that it is a geological strata. It is, it is very difficult to be even surfaced. I'm just, is this the double bind, something that <laughs> emerges as the, f as the making of the film work? Yeah. Or is it the double bind that is a priori? I'm just curious, because of the your earlier 86 film, it mm -hmm. is almost an explosive structure. Mm -hmm. And the weeness is 
what I was telling to Davia, the Venus was amazingly uh, open in a mm. sense that it could take anyone into it mm. as, a, as figures. But in this, it is more calibrated. The, yes. the markings are more calibrated. Yes. No, so no. I was just curious structurally as a film. I mean, um, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, not so much geological, but I, I think the structure of, of um, our muses was much more informed by the idea of trying to construct a sorrow song, a kind of Trauerspiel, you know, uh, a sort of mourning play, for want of a better word. Um, because in a sense, there's nothing to say. You know, with, with Hansworth, there was, there was a lot to say. There was um, anticipation of an opening, a rapture, and so on and so forth. This is really uh, an attempt to say something about how things come to an end, you know. Um, so we, we struggled with trying to construct the counterpoint for the more active, more granular, uh, more uh, present tense material, which is strangely enough, the past. <laughs> the archival stuff is, is the past. How do you provide a, a counterpoint? To that, which suggests that 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 in many ways the lives you're watching in the black and white are more. I mean, there's not one person alive other than maybe a few of the children. Children. Yes. Almost almost no one in that film is alive. And I was reminded of um, a story I was told in Australia where. You know, a number of black Australians were saying to me that once someone dies, images of them are forbidding because, you know, then you're trespassing in, in, in the space of, of the dead. You know. it, it, that was a very strong feeling yeah. you know, when you knew that every can you opened was almost mm -hmm. a kind of mausoleum. Not simply the characters, but the scenarios, the, uh, the choreographies of life, they're all gone. I mean, so in a way, it's not the usual stuff about the cinema and time and dead, and t dead time and so on. This, this, is, this is it in, in reality. <laughs> you know, this isn't just a, a, a meditation on Tom Mort in, in cinema. I mean, it really literally is the opening of a series of coffins every time we, we got a film out. And so trying to find a way of then providing a counterpoint which didn't lie to people, it didn't say to you, well, you know, actually the people in there were happy and now they're sad, or you know, they're really sad and now they're happy. You know, but trying to provide those sort of false dichotomies was something that, that preyed a lot on my mind, certainly. You know, um, and that might account for this slightly hemmed in you know, feel that you're talking about. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question, Jude, but that's some of the things that it made me think of. As you were it's not the happiest of films I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, it was very different when we made Hands With Songs. And it's, it's striking because we haven't ever screened the two together because The Nine Muses is quite, quite new. But 30 years difference, you know, as John was saying, opening every can, looking at every piece of film, we knew those people were dead. It was 30 years ago. We didn't, it, it, we didn't take the same kind of sensibility to the archive to a certain extent that we took to this particular archive in a sort of, you know, trying to build a monument for people we knew were dead. Quite literally, the people in the film, the people that we knew, you know. Um, so it was, it was, we did take a different sensibility to it. It was quite frightening at times, really, just knowing what we were doing. Not dealing just the with. people in it. You know, there's one of my favorite uh, filmmakers was a British filmmaker called Philip Donnellan. Mm -hmm. I've used his stuff in just about anything I've done in the past. 
He's the guy who made the film that the, the, the man in the museum at the beginning of Hansworth songs comes from. And, and that's the same guy who's at the beginning of Hansworth songs, the one who also comes at the end of Hansworth songs and says, we will elevate ourselves learning from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I go mm. back to the colony and there he is. Yes. Um, except that that sequence is the stuff that was shot six months before. And now he's saying something else. He's saying, you know, I've just arrived and I'm a bus conductor and, and I have to find a way of making this shit work for me. It's not quite what I thought, but I have to find a way of making this shit work for me. He's gone. He's, you know, uh, when I saw him in Hansworth songs, Lynn is right. Mm. Uh, during the research of yeah. Hansworth songs in 85, yeah. there was a possibility that he was alive. They were alive. alive. Mm. Not now. He's gone a long time ago. You know? Um, and that does something to your head. It also does something mm. to your practice. Mm. When people you've known, you know, and I say known because that's what it is. I've known these figures forever. The man who says, I love you, you know? Like, I saw him make that statement in 85, and I fell in love with this guy because he seemed to dramatize something about colonial becoming that I've always wanted to use in something. Here he is, and you look at him, and he's got this gash across his face. He's a gangster, but he's trying to cover it with a beard, and it hasn't quite worked, you know? So he's sitting in his house, and he's obviously been asked a question like, you know, so, so what do you feel about being here and about the English. And he says, look, you know, mm. I love you, but the majority of you don't love we. And, and the bit that kills me is when he says, you know, but we came with pure heart. <laughs> pure heart. And mm. um, this is a gangster. He's probably never said this to his wife. You know? Mm. And he's saying it to a filmmaker who's gone. And he's gone, and you know, it, it, it just changes your relationship to the image when it's infused with that level of nostalgia. You know, uh, it changes how you approach the use of it uh, in a way that it didn't. I didn't have that you know, 25 years ago. <laughs> it was like it was just images, you know, mm -hmm. now, now they're more. Mm -hmm. That's all I meant. Okay. Um. I don't see any more questions, and um, it's been a very, very Thank rich so evening. Thank you so much. And thank you for putting the two you. films together yeah. because it's given me a lot to think about too. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming. Seen. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everyone. For thank, you. thank you. Thank you.